Welcome to What That Means with Camille, companion episodes to the In Technology podcast. In this series, Camille asks top technical experts to explain, in plain English, commonly used terms in their field, then dives deeper, giving you insights into the hottest topics and arguments they face. Get the definition directly from those who are defining it. Now, here is Camille Moorhart. Today, we are going to talk about what that means, indigenous data sovereignty. I have three people with me today. We have Don Nafis, who's an anthropologist and senior research scientist at Intel Labs. We have Bobby Marr, who's member of the Mayam Nayiri Wingara Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective in Australia, joining us from Australia. And we have Karaitiana Tairu, who is part of the Maori, well, he's a Maori Indigenous Data Specialist, joining us all the way from New Zealand. Welcome, everybody. So I think we're going to have to start the old-fashioned way and just have ask one of you to define Indigenous data sovereignty. I just want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the traditional lands here of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples in Canberra, and just to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so the way in which we define Indigenous data sovereignty is the right of Indigenous peoples to govern the collection, ownership and application of data about Indigenous communities, peoples, lands and resources. So thank you. So my first question is, why does this need to be looked at or considered differently than collecting data of any other human being? Why, why is there even a term Indigenous data sovereignty? Historically, for Indigenous peoples, data has been used, it's been weaponized against us. So it's been used as a mechanism to exclude us, to portray us in a very deficit and problematic lens. We have been invisible, really, in kind of the, the production and the reuse of data about us. When we think about data collection, is this kind of amplified in the world of artificial intelligence and just internet collection of large quantities of data? Has this always been an issue or is it a more recent issue? It's, it's always been an issue, but I think traditionally, at least for Maori, it's not been an issue that's been discussed because we've always been fighting for social inequities, health um, inequities, getting land back, and basically fighting racism in the system. And they're all things that you can physically see, things that you deal with every day. Yet when it comes to data, it's not something you really see or know about unless you work in the digital area. So it hasn't really been an issue at the forefront for Māori uh, up until about maybe four years ago. So one of the things that Bobby's mentioned to me in prior conversation is it's not just about collection of data and stewardship of data. It's about constructs that the data is being looked at. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys can go into a little bit more detail on that. Professor Maggie Walter has constantly written about and spoken about how data and the use of data sets sort of to inform, you know, public policy is often used, she refers to it as the 5D data. So what she's talking about is differences, deprivation, dysfunctional, disadvantage and disparity. So data that represents those. And again, she also uses this term of badder data, which is about blaming. It's about aggregating the, di the data, decontextualizing the data, it's using deficits data and restricted access. So we as Indigenous peoples are not able to access that data. In particular, this thing around aggregating the data is really um, problematic because as First Nations people here in Australia, we are very diverse within our own nations. And so Within that diversity, we will have different life worlds, we'll have different values and priorities. That is actually not taken into account then when particular policies and strategies 
actually being developed and being implemented as a way of, you know, helping Indigenous peoples. It's not actually telling the true story of who we are as First Nations people in Australia. Karai Tiano, do you have a take on that? Sure. I, basically, I support everything that Bobby said. An example for New Zealand Māori is with the COVID-19 rollout of immunisation. There's a deep mistrust by Māori populations of the health system. and There's been generations of discrimination. Tribal groups wanted to um, use health data to um, visit communities that needed the COVID rollout. The Ministry of Health in New Zealand basically said, no, you can't have it. It ended up going to the High Court, <clears throat> and the High Court said that the Ministry of Health must reevaluate their decision to provide the iwi or the tribes the data. Uh, because in New Zealand, we have a constitutional document called the, the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, and, and that gives <clears throat> a number of protection mechanisms to Māori, including to resources, which include data. If we had access to that data early, we could have improved the health outputs of a number of Māori communities. So you're saying that in this example, there's maybe health information or health data collected about a certain population, or at least the, the data is segmented by various kinds of, I guess we could call them arbitrary or real segmentations or classifications of people. Um, and in this case, then the actual communities where the data is gathered don't no longer have access to the data that's collected? That's correct. And despite the government ha having access to the, the data and knowing which data is Māori and which data is not Māori, it's not shared with community providers to enhance the communities. So another, I guess, question is there's different kinds of privacy regulations when it comes to data that we see around the world. And I know that those are really not orchestrated or standardized globally. But there's things in place, like, for example, in the EU, GDPR, sort of a general privacy regulation for individuals. Is this similar or is there a kind of a different lens to look at this? In New Zealand, we have our own um, privacy laws. And again, we have the Titiriti or Waitangi, the, the constitutional documents, which also say that the government must co-govern and co-design with Māori. Now, if they did that with data, then all the uh, data sovereignty principles, Indigenous or Māori principles, would then be recognised, and then we would be able to share and fight inequities with um, especially health data, but all data in general. One thing you were saying, Karaitiana, is this notion of data belonging to an individual is kind of culturally specific and not specific to Māori. I'm wondering if you can elaborate that on that a little bit. So prior to colonisation, everything was communally owned and there was no one person owned something. We, we have a concept called kaitiakitanga, which means that you're the guardian of a resource um, and it's your role <clears throat> to make sure that resource is looked after in better condition or uh, more healthier than when you got it for the next generation. In terms of data, there's, we have tribal, yeah, tribal ownership of data and then only some data would be considered personal data, and that could be your personal health record. But then from a, a tribal perspective, sharing um, high-level data is acceptable from a Māori perspective. One of the other kind of questions I think, you know, Bobby, you were talking about this too, was the, looking at, you are saying the categorization of deficit and viewing a population asking even the way that you structure an experiment or a questionnaire or a survey or something, or the way that you're looking at information or cutting data is going to then put a certain population in deficit, that maybe those questions themselves are biased inherently by the culture who's asking them. I'm wondering if you can talk about that more. Yeah, I guess the way in which... Um you know, what we refer to as administrative data. So it's our national statistical officers that run these national surveys asking Indigenous peoples 
questions within that survey. It's it's very much framed from a a Western lens. And I guess one of the issues around then the analysis is that we are constantly then being compared to the non-Indigenous population where we have very different worldviews and values and perspectives and priorities. That is interesting. And Don, from your perspective, kind of embedded in a major technology company, I'm wondering how you look at applying um, Karaitiana and Bobby's input. The situation I see today is one where my engineering colleagues, you know, sort of across companies as well as in my own, you know, they'll be able to say, sure, we can look at this and that data set and, you know, parse it by demographic categories. Um, but that extra step that uh, shouldn't be extra at all that both Bobby and Cartier are talking about to then ask, wait, why and how is this data being collected at all? By whom and to what ends? Those questions get really hard really fast. And either they're sort of pushed down the you know, down the chain, we don't want to think about them, or, you know, it's somehow it's magically too hard when you ask the more fundamental question. Um, and I, I just see constant evidence of it getting skirted around. And, and, and the, the very real issue of who is data for is just so darn hard to ask. And I think especially when you're talking about issues of sovereignty, one of the things I'm I'm particularly concerned about here is, you know, since we're talking a lot about medical data, right, one of the areas, for example, that um, many technology um, companies are very excited about is using natural language processing in medical records, right? So sort of looking through medical records and doing, you know, summarization or sort of analysis. And it's like, wait a second, if that's going to happen, how the heck are you? you going to be able to, you know, if if the problem is already we have different notions of what bodies are, what care looks like, who should be caring for whom, if that's already going on in a clinical setting, right, if that if there's gaps there, and then you're sticking NLP on top, right, that's a disaster waiting to happen, right? Um, so, I, you know, I think we really do have to start at this data level and, at, and these really key questions that um, uh, you know, um, both of these scholars are raising. One thing with Indigenous data sovereignty is the way it's enacted is through Indigenous data governance as well. And so this is a really important element. The two go together. The importance of having Indigenous data governance to be able to govern the control and the access of data. I, I have to ask about sort of a framework, I guess, for this, because I'm thinking about all different kinds of people who whose data is collected um, that can then be broken down by all different sorts of any kind of category you can think of. I think t typically by, you know, female, male breakdown, um, at least in the United States, a lot of the breakdown is by race, right, slash ethnicity, I'll say. Um there's other ways that people break it down by education level, by income level. Those are some just common ones that I've seen in data. Um, and I'm wondering, in this case, you're saying the there is you know, a group of people, indigenous people or Maori people in this case, who want the right to govern and manage access to that data. Um, and and have access themselves to the data that's collected and and maybe even participate in the questions being asked and the segmentation that's being done. How does that apply to kind of broader humanity? So if you're breaking if you're breaking this apart, you know, if you're breaking data down by sex or gender, then how do you give that same kind of uh, management or control to people who are not in a collective or a group? I, I think in terms of Indigenous peoples, we all belong to community collectives and groups. The most Indigenous peoples I know of, <clears throat> this is normal, having you know tribes or um, community groups. So I, I guess the question would be how to apply those same principles to non-Indigenous peoples. But then just my personal opinion is that from a Western perspective, 
those community groups don't exist and aren't applicable. Um, so from my Western um, gene genealogical connections, I wouldn't want community groups having access to my data. Um, but I'm more than happy from a Māori perspective for my Māori community groups to have access because that's normal for me. You may have ties to a Western culture, we'll call it, um, who's may maybe government, for lack of a better <laughs> term, you don't necessarily want to have access or view to your data. And for that, something like GDPR might protect you. I, I know that's specific to the EU. But when it comes to indigenous data, you're saying that aspect of you, at least speaking for yourself, you trust. Is that because there's inherent an inherent trust there with the governance? And so it's okay for that entity to have access to your data? And I think you mean an aggregate, like without personally identifiable. My perspective is that it's a community or a communal benefit to my community. So I'm happy for that. If it was my, say, my suburb in Christchurch that I live in wanting access to my data, I'm not related to anyone in my suburb. I, I, that there's no um, genealogical connections whatsoever. And we can move in and out of the suburb, uh, and people do. So I, I wouldn't want that to be shared with the community. Um, but yeah, as I say, with my Māori communities, um, it's an um, intergenerational commitment we have to each other. So I want my data to be shared. Very interesting. And also kind of your point, Karaitiana, that it's not applicable. This concept of data belonging to a collective is not necessarily applicable outside of Indigenous communities. I'm sure there may be an example. There are a couple of exceptions to that rule. I, I work in places where our mental health is a real problem. And that is one example where actually people do want data pooled locally for a particular reason, because there's a collective harm happening. So they'll kind of get past all the other constraints um, to sort of create that collectivity. But no, it does not fall, you know, as, as, as everyone else here is saying, it doesn't fall along, you know, the traditional sociological demographic categories. It's not about that. So it's, it's almost like a self-identified collective is kind of where that line is drawn. I'm trying to figure out like how you apply this in technology, because um, is it just something that you apply then to the indigenous community that's requesting, or is it something that you are trying to apply more broadly? And if so, what are how do you understand the definition of a collective and how do people opt into that? In New Zealand, uh, Maori society is made from what you would call a tribe. And a tribe consists of a number of um, what you'd call clans. And clans are made, of, made up of a number of families. So in New Zealand, the, the way to achieve Māori data sovereignty would be to use the tribal names, the clan names, and the geographic locations names. And then for people to be able to opt out. Every Māori person is born with that biological connection, but some don't choose to be Māori. Have, giving people the opt-out opportunity would certainly um, solve that issue and allow the communities to access the data. You know, there's two things that we hit on that I want to talk about a little bit more. And one is, um, one is this notion of structuring questions. I'll just say structuring data, how you're slicing and dicing data, what you're asking and what you're looking at. Rather than working hard to just remove bias or identified bias, looking, reaching into communities that you're attempting to represent with the data to make sure that the questions themselves are pertinent and relevant. And can we talk more about how that would happen? This is where data governance is really important as well, because you would want to work with representatives who they're not speaking for that collective, but they they have a relationship with that, that collective for the contextualization of what that data is going to represent. It needs to be coming from the the interests of those people who the focus is on. And I guess just to add on to that, if, if it's okay, one of the things I hear going on in the tech world is 
this impulse to do some level of public outreach, but in the form of education. And which to me just doubles down on the very problem that Bobby just talked about, which is, you know, I, maybe that's not actually what the public needs at all, like, right? Maybe instead the information needs to flow the other way a little bit, right? Bef before we can even get to a, a discussion. So one thing that comes up time and time again is this idea of, well, you know, um, they're really, you know, if, if part of the problem is that the data collection happens by and for a, a narrow and privileged group of folks, um, then we need to change who's doing that data collection and that data analysis. Um, and I just was hoping both of you would talk about sort of how you think about that. Is that um, an important direction? Are there also limitations? Um, to that kind of approach? How does that approach situate in the sorts of things that you care about? Um, so yeah, I think it's important to um, co-design and co-govern and co-manage uh, with in New Zealand with Māori communities. If you don't, then the Western perspective becomes the dominant truth of the data. It's common for uh, Māori as well to have um, multiple generations in a home as not because of poverty, it's not because of bad parenting or anything, it's because it's our culture, that's how we live. Um, yet, um, if those perspectives aren't incorporated at the start, it's, yeah, it, it does end up being bias or a Western perspective. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we are uh, sort of focusing a lot of our energy in is how we start to build capability within communities around data literacy, um, data analysis, and really just understanding, you know, what what data is and what it can actually do for Indigenous peoples and communities. Um, like that's really important to, you know, empower people and for the self-determination um, of people's own sovereignty and control. So the other thing that you have mentioned is uh, Indigenous peoples are not a singular group, but you're saying specific, you know, there's multiple different tribes, as you said. And so talk about uh, how, you know, I guess how the tribes are working together on this um, on this call for data sovereignty and then how, um, how you reconcile kind of those differences among the different people that... that are in the collective together? Uh, in New Zealand, we have, um, I think we have about 115 different tribes. Many of those tribes have formed a group who consult with the government. But overall, most um, most tribes want the same things. We want inequities to be rectified within health, education, the justice system, throughout everything. So it's not really too difficult the issues would be when the clans um, want um, specific data because it's very, very different throughout the whole country. Is there any big topic within the topic of Indigenous data sovereignty that we've not covered in this conversation? I know we didn't have time to go in a lot of depth, but... I am part of uh, GIDA, which is the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. There is this focus on what is known as the FAIR principles. So that sort of translates to findable, accessible, um, interoperable and reusable. That's sort of the breakdown of it. But these principles are quite data centric. Um, and then when we're thinking about Indigenous peoples, you know, we come from this, this place of you know, being people-centric and purpose-centric. Yeah, like being able to centre sort of Indigenous worldviews and practices and, um, you know, the collective. So the care principles really break down to like the collective benefit, uh, the authority to control, the responsibility and then ethics in relation to data practices. Probably uh, something else that's worth mentioning is the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. 
Now, I'm pretty sure Australia, Canada, and America didn't sign it, but I, I could be wrong. But I mean, every other um, UN um, country did sign it. And, and that gives Indigenous peoples um, a number of rights to data. So data scientists in a UN country should be familiar with um, UNDRIP. Well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate the conversation, and it's been really educational and informative to me. I have I had not heard of indigenous data sovereignty, and now I see it as like an absolute imperative um, that everybody should know about in the tech world. So, thank you so much for giving us an introduction. To- Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube, or search for In Technology wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation.